Good evening, and welcome to, once again, the Elizabeth Seton Lectures. The Religious Studies Department of Mount St. Vincent University, with the sponsorship of the Sisters of Charity, are pleased to inaugurate the 11th, the 11th, mind you, the 11th year of this lecture series. And uh, this time we are, are also pleased to bring an outstanding expression of Christian thought to this campus and to this area in the person of Father Richard McCormick. <laughs> Father Richard McCormick. Uh, there are a few Richards around in the area of ethics, aren't there? <laughs> anyway. Um, before I introduce him to you, I would like to continue our usual custom of uh, recalling, at the opening of the first session, recalling the origin and purpose of this lecture series. And uh, to do that, I would like to invite Sister Maria Sutherland, who is the superior of the Halifax province of the Sisters of Charity, to uh, tell us about that. Sister Maria? Good evening, and welcome again to this annual event at Mount St. Vincent, the Elizabeth Seton Lectures. For those who are not familiar with the history of this event, a few facts. Eleven years ago, encouraged by the Sisters of Charity, who were at that time on the university faculty, the Halifax province of the Sisters of Charity established a fund to finance an annual lecture series designed to assist Mount St. Vincent University in promoting an atmosphere characterized by Catholic tradition. The general theme of the lectures, to be Christian presence in the world. Dr. McCormick is the 11th renowned speaker to come to Halifax as a result of this decision. We named this event after St. Elizabeth Seton whom we honor as the foundress of the Sisters of Charity in North America. Mother Seton, as she is known to us, was a leader among the women of her time. She was a wife, the mother of five, a single parent for many years, a teacher and a religious foundress. Few of us cannot identify her with her in some way. Her own eagerness for understanding the truth a goal of Mount St. Vincent, led her to many difficult choices. The decision to become a Roman Catholic and so align herself with poor immigrants. In the New York of her time, only immigrants were Catholics, as her wealthy relatives told her in no uncertain terms. The decision to leave familiar and well-loved people and places to open a school in Baltimore. Decisions about her own relationships, her children, her religious sisters. For while the contemporary moral issues of her times may have differed from those Dr. McCormick will consider with us, the question of what is good and what is the right thing to do will have rung in her heart as clearly as it does in ours. Mount St. Vincent, in its statement of philosophy, recognizes the need of moral convictions as the foundation of a worthwhile way of life and commits itself to develop in its students a priority of values in order that they may judge, evaluate, and decide in a responsible manner. In a very direct way, these goals are surely related to the topic of this year's Elizabeth Seton Lectures. When this lecture series was established, its administration became the responsibility of the Religious Studies Department of Mount St. Vincent. And I would like to take this opportunity to express our appreciation for the faithful way in which they have carried forward that task since 1978. We of the Christian community of Halifax Metro have been enriched by the excellence and variety of their choice of lecturers and I am sure this year will be no exception. It is with pleasure that the Sisters of Charity collaborate with the Religious Studies Department of Mount St. Vincent to offer you tonight's program as a tangible sign 
of our continued commitment to this university and to the search for excellence in the living of our lives. Thank you, Sister Maria. It has been said that no Catholic ethicist has reflected more consistently on the problems and uh, the field of ethics in general than Richard McCormick. His career has spanned a good number of years, and you have a brief outline of that career in the brochure that you have in hand. Dr. McCormick has been a member of the Society of Jesus, a Jesuit, for the past 48 years. He is presently the John A. O'Brien Professor of Christian Ethics at Notre Dame University in Indiana. He has published 14 books, the most recent of which is entitled The Critical Calling, Moral Dilemmas Since Vatican II. He is a regular contributor to many journals, including Christianity and Crisis, Concilium, Cross Currents, Theological Studies, the Lineker Quarterly, Journal of the American Medical Association, Perspectives in Biology and Medicine, and the Hastings Report. Father McCormick's audience also includes readers of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and to the surprise of some, Sports Illustrated. <laughs> Father McCormick has been president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. He has been on the boards of directors of the American Society of Christian Ethics and the Church's Center for Theology and Public Policy, among many others. He has been involved with the editorial boards of many ethics journals and been a member of many ethics committees, particularly in the field of health and medical ethics. Two awards in particular indicate the esteem in which he is held. Back in 1969, he was presented with the Catholic Theological Society of America's award as Outstanding Theologian of the Year. And last year, in 1988, he was given the Henry Knowles Beecher Award from the Hastings Center for Lifetime Contributions to Ethics and Life Sciences. Moreover, in recognition of his expertise, his scholarship, and his commitment to theological reflection in the field of ethics, he's been awarded eight honorary degrees by universities in North America and Europe. One of his colleagues, I will not continue to embarrass you, Father, one of his colleagues not too long ago spoke of Father McCormick's, and I quote, spoke of Father McCormick's humility, born of the conviction that within a pilgrim church, he is a pilgrim theologian. Well, we are very pleased this evening that his pilgrimage has brought him to this small shrine of knowledge on the east coast of Canada, to Mount St. Vincent University. And we extend to him our warmest welcome to the Mount to our area and ask him to speak to us this evening on contemporary moral issues and their context. Father Richard McCormick. Well, thank you very much, Barry. It's a pleasure to be here with you, I'm sure. A uh, real honor, because I know the people who have preceded me. There was one thing, however, that was um, uh, curiously omitted in uh, your presentation of my uh, credentials, and I want to I fill that in. The, um, back in the year 1974, I had the temerity to uh, uh, author an article for the Journal of the American Medical Association on the treatment of disabled newborns. And uh, somehow or other, this got on the AP UPI wires and got uh, circulated all over the world, literally. 
And I began to get a great deal of mail, 20 or 30 letters a day, uh, for about three or four weeks. And some of the most creative hate mail I've ever received. It, um, even though the position taken was, was really a, a modest one. Well, I'll never forget one letter which started off in this way. It said, there are very few genuinely bad people born into this world. Why do so many join the Jesuits? <laughs> That's the way the letter began, you see. Well, to, uh, to be a moral theologian in our time, there are two basic requirements. A very thick epidermis and a sense of humor. So you don't take yourself too seriously. Just seriously enough, but not too seriously. And I hope that uh, that will cover uh, and uh, excuse the things that I have to say in the next uh, three presentations. My subject tonight is contemporary moral issues and their context. Now, most of you, I'm sure, know the issues. Uh, there's, let me just go down the list uh, of things that come to mind almost without uh, malice of forethought. The ethics of international relations, uh, particularly, for example, strategic policy and most especially uh, the ethics of nuclear deterrence. The ethics of apartheid. The ethics of the economy, whom it serves, whom it enslaves. The ethics of business, um, international protectionism, uh, corporate bribery, things like that. Ethics in health care. Access to health care is a macroethical problem. And some of the microethical problems would uh, include some of the following. The use of fetal tissue from elective abortions. Uh, the use of artificial nutrition hydration for patients in a persistent vegetative state. Reproductive technologies. Uh, IVF, in vitro fertilization. GIF. Zift, Zippy, uh, all of these things that we now call acronymic reproduction, uh, genetic therapy. Then in sexual ethics, there are, I put this at the end, you see, uh, premarital and marital uh, ethics. What to do about the gay community? And on and on and on. These are all the issues. However, my title is Contemporary Moral Issues and Their Context. Now, most of us, I think, are least interested in the context. I am most interested in the context. Now, the word context can refer to several things. First, it can refer to the circumstances, the cultural circumstances in which these problems reside the changing circumstances, and therefore the changing nature of the problem. Or uh, the term context can refer to the attitudes and the assumptions that we bring to such problems. Now, I want to emphasize this. The attitudes and the assumptions about what morality is, how we go about discerning the rightfulness, the wrongfulness of conduct, and so on, um, these attitudes and assumptions will often determine, first of all, how I think about these issues. And I think in 99% of the time, they will tell me where I come out on most of them. So that's what I want to emphasize this evening, is the context of contemporary moral issues. And all I want to do is think through with you several dimensions of this context in the hope that we will have a little clearer idea, even if a more confused and complicated one, of the nature of ethical uh, deliberation in our time. It has been said, and I think quite accurately, that the Second Vatican Council reinserted the Church into history, into the world, and into Christendom. Excuse me. It's also commonplace to interpret such a statement 
as meaning a move from an earlier classical consciousness to a new historical consciousness, aware of the changing nature, of the limited nature of our grasp of significance, and so on. Now, to me, taking uh, the historical consciousness seriously means looking at our culture, the ethos in which we live, and taking that uh, with utter seriousness as the framer of our moral problems, as the framer of our own self-consciousness and awareness as we go about trying to analyze these problems. Now, that means, very frankly, a fresh look at the way we have gone about things in the past. Fresh looks often lead to new emphases and, at times, to modified conclusions. Now, this is resisted, powerfully resisted, certainly in the Catholic community, and I think most religious communities have their analogs to uh, the far right. Uh, a new fundamentalism is emerging in, in virtually every religious group that we know. And I say, therefore, there are powerful forces resisting this, this new look at contemporary problems in terms of our attitudes and assumptions, our context, because uh, precisely moral convictions are very personal. Most of us have a tremendously personal investment in our own moral convictions and we're very reluctant to modify them. And that's why uh, people can disagree about whether Jesus Christ was God or not, see, whether uh, the, vir or the Blessed Virgin was immaculately conceived or not, and nothing really happens. Uh, you say, well, you disagree with that, fine. You disagree with somebody on abortion, and uh, the roof tends to come off. That's the nature of moral conviction and moral problems. Now, in my judgment, the, the context has changed in many, many ways. What I want to do is simply lift out seven in a sacramental spirit, uh, where I believe that the very way we think about the moral life, the way we uh, approach these problems, has been modified in the past 20 or 25 years. And I'll continue uh, this uh, in more in detail as I take up particular problems tomorrow. So the first way the context has changed is there has been a widespread rejection, certainly within the Catholic community, of what I will call legalism. Now, legalism is a point of view and a corresponding emotional response that gives priority to a human structure over the gospel value it is meant to serve. Practically, as Daniel McGuire has noted on several occasions, it's a gimmick whereby we get all wrapped up in lesser laws and get frightfully serious about them. We convince ourselves that we are good because of their observance. Now, this is the constant temptation of uh, people of religious faith, to find something other than the faith, some crutch upon which they can lean, which will identify them. Uh, St. Paul railed against that in uh, the letter to the Galatians. Um, down deep we know that we must recover our faith on a daily basis. However, legalism, as I say, is a constant temptation of religious people. The Pharisees were, were familiar with it. They would not put out a lamp on the Sabbath, untie a knot on the Sabbath. Uh, the Protestant community has had its go with this in terms of its attitudes years ago toward things like dancing, especially on Sunday, on drinking and smoking, though I think in these latter two cases they may well have been on to something that uh, we're catching on to ourselves now. Certainly the Catholic community has been deeply, deeply captivated by the legalistic spirit in its interpretation and understanding of uh, past traditions such as Friday abstinence, Sunday observance, the Eucharistic fast, uh, even, I would think, our sexual ethics in many ways. I remember when I started uh, teaching moral theology in 1957, there was a whole literature distinguishing sewing from knitting 
as forbidden work, a servile work on Sundays. I can look around and see some of you uh, are old enough to recall that. We may recall, too, the times when we picked out little pieces of ham from a split pea soup, thinking we were doing something profoundly religious on Fridays. Now, the fearsome thing about this attitude is this. I, I circle certain things that I must do, you see. The implication being, first, other things don't count very much, and secondly, these things get me into good standing, you see, with the Lord. Now, the new emphasis today, and it's been in the community for any number of years, does not, or at least should not, reject the notion of law. We need good laws. They're a symbol around which a community coheres. You see. Uh, good laws are uh, corrective of our inconstancy and instructive of our ignorance. All right. But if they are to function properly for us, we must function on the value to which they point and of which they are signs. As Anglo-Saxons, I think we've simply missed this, and for decades we missed this. Uh, for many people, uh, Friday abstinence meant a move from prime rib to main rock lobster. Uh, this was a form of penance, you see. We were taking up, uh, we were taking up our crosses and relaxing. Now, for, for this and other reasons, uh, Pope Paul VI changed the entire uh, penitential discipline of the church 23 years ago, 1966. But we can miss what he was doing. What he was equivalently doing, you see, was changing our whole focus on the moral life. You see. Now, in St. Paul, for example, concrete ethical directives are an aid to understanding something deeper the call to sanctification. Equivalently, Pope Paul was saying, we can't prescribe these things anymore across the boards for all cultures. You've got to decide what is appropriate penance for you, what your share in the cross is going to be. Now, this shift in institutional uh, penitential practices was, again, but a symbol of an entire moral theological shift away from rules and individual actions, what I call photographic morality. You see, Take the picture, I got what you did. Forgetting the context, the growth, the person, you see. So it was a shift away from that to a values and lifestyle. Equivalently, uh, what was happening in this shift was that the Holy Father was urging us to ask not what is sinful, what is not, what is an obligatory uh, Sunday attendance, what is not, and so on. But he said, change the questions. How can you be a Christian in a thoroughly sensate culture? You've got to decide that for yourselves, and your eternal destiny decides, uh, uh, hangs on it. Uh, what is the really constructive, con uh, Christianly constructive use of money, of pleasure, Married people uh, are urged not to ask what is right and wrong with this and that practice. Again, photographic morality. They're asked to say, how can we as a couple uh, be a sacrament to the world? By our life, our lifestyle, show as a ministry, show the world a little more of what being two in one means. And that will be a reflection of what three in one means means, the Godhead. So the, the moral problems that we consider to be of interest, really interest and concern to people, are much more now the 3 a.m. problems, uh, where we linger between sleep and wakefulness and wonder about the direction of our lives, about our integrity, our guilt before God, our phoniness. This makes us... this is what concerns us and should concern us above all. So a move away from the legalisms of the past. Uh, the second shift in context is what I will call the depth of the moral life. 
Now, in our ordinary way of thinking and acting, I think we identify the moral, spiritual life far too much with individual actions. I'm continuing a little bit what I, I just developed. The attention is heavily focused on discrete actions and omissions, especially of an external kind. Actually, beyond such symptomatic manifestations, something much more interesting and profound is going on as we grow, as we grow as human beings. Morality, therefore, is above all a matter of a profound personal response, the acceptance and deepening of God's enabling love into my being, or by contrast, the ratification of sin, capital S, in the unfolding of my life. Thus, the moral act is not primarily uh, this or that action, but it's a profound self-disposition, a self-actualization, the yes of faith flowering into love. Sin is a change in this basic direction. Conversion is a reestablishing of this fundamental posture. So the love that the Holy Spirit is trying to work out in our lives that love cannot be identified with this or that action, sacrifice, observance, or failure. That is to fall back into, as I say, a photographic uh, morality, morality without a personal context. It's much more and primary to the use of our fundamental freedom in acceptance or rejection of God's enabling empowerment. So when the moral life is viewed in this way, it is much more of a growth process with all that that means. And, and we, especially Catholics, and I speak as a Catholic theologian now, have to hang our heads for the type of moral catechesis we gave in the way we did not train people to think of their lives as growth processes, but much more as individual steps, failures, and advances, and so forth. An image might help here. I think we could say that marriage is a thousand and one things a week. It's a matter of sacrifice, frustrations, difficulties, celebrations, and so forth. But beneath them all, something much more interesting and profound is happening. Two people are growing into one in that very mysterious symbiosis that we can recognize, but we really can't describe very accurately. Now, this, this notion of the moral life has enormous implications for the way we think about moral problems. What is a serious moral problem? What is not? Uh, how we confess our sins. How we even conceive of sin. See, is affected by the way we think of the moral act. This is not a new idea. Even the, the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith has used the notion in the past ten years though I say parenthetically uh, and not without respect that I think it uh, misrepresented the idea. The third dimension that constitutes a context within which we approach the moral life and moral problems in our time, I will call the social character of the moral life. Now, what I mean to do here is simply to point out that the focus of attention has shifted in terms of what we think and what we ought to think is important and what is not. Let me develop the idea in this way. I think it's true to say that the Catholic community over the past uh, 100 years has had a veritable series of absolutely outstanding social statements, say from Rerum Novarum, whose anniversary we were going to celebrate in 1991. Uh, through Quadragesimo Anno to Moderate Magistra, Laborum Exercens, and then most recently uh, John Paul II's uh, Solicitudo Rei Socialis. Yet, those on the one hand, and yet on the other we have what I think uh, we, we can describe as a, a corporate apathy on the part of most people, a dormant social conscience. So one of the, one of the emphases, uh, and it constitutes the context in which we think about problems, uh, one of the emphases in contemporary moral theology, therefore, is 
an emphasis on the fact that our radical acceptance of God is tied to a love of neighbor, a love that secures rights, relieves suffering, promotes growth. This means not simple one-to-one uh, -one ministries to those that we ordinarily like to avoid, minorities, addicts, uh, criminals, the starving, the sick, and so on. It means much more the, uh, the corporate organization of the community in a way which is effective in dealing with the structures which yield these things. Uh, John Paul II referred to uh, the notion of social sin and, uh, and gave it a legitimacy which uh, it didn't have prior to his use. So the structures and the institutions which oppress people, which alienate them, deprive them of rights, are embodiments of our sinful condition. The sins and selfishness of one generation become the inhibiting conditions of the next. The impoverishment of the exploited embodies the selfishness of the exploiter. Once again, this is saying in a different way what Pope Paul VI said in Octogesum of Banians. These are the problems which must occupy prime concern in the minds of Christians. Not primarily sexual abuses, Father Hesburgh uh, stated on several occasions that were he to be elected per impossibile the Pope, he would decree a moratorium on all official church statements on sex for 10 years. <laughs> I think he had something like this in mind. Let, let's get our priorities uh, lined up. So contemporary moral theology has come to realize in a fresh and new way that just as Christ's liberation is twofold from sin and from its expression in our structures, so the church's activity, the church is simply the continuation of Christ's presence, so her activity has got to be a liberation from sin in the hearts of individuals and also the manifestation in our sinful structures. Now I emphasize this because it's so easy to forget it. There are still millions of people, I encounter them all the time, who, who advertise their Samaritanism by saying, some of my best friends are black. Uh, they really reveal by that type of statement, and you, you can find similar statements, I'm sure, uh, they only advertise, or I should say thinly disguise, their own non-perception and non-involvement of the character of the problems with which we deal. If persons are truly what we say they are, redeemed in Christ and sharers of his unspeakable sonship, if we're really that here and now, and it's not something we will be if we behave, you see, we will be later on. No, we are that now. Then preaching this evangelization means doing all those things that remind persons of their true dignity. For if a person is indeed someone of dignity, he or she must be treated as such. To deny human rights or to tolerate their deprivation is to tell people in a very concrete way they aren't worth it. They aren't worth it. That they aren't dignified. In other words, we are reminded of our dignity by being treated that way. It's axiomatic that we only learn to love by being loved, and that therefore the best give, gift we can give each other is to love each other. I don't mean a, a, a nice, a sloppy, uh, a contentless type of thing. That's what the word has come to mean, an emotional thing. I mean a very tough type of thing that trusts and cares and tells the truth. That's the best gift we can give each other because it's empowering. Hence the church's proclamation is necessarily action. She doesn't civilize in order to evangelize, as Pius XI put it. She civilizes because it's the basic way of evangelizing and telling people what they are worth. So that's uh, 
the third area, I think, of, of shift that constitutes the context. In other words, some of those problems I mentioned at the outset would be put at the bottom of the list, right where I had them, in terms of the priorities that they, they claim, you see, given this shift in context. The fourth shift I will mention is a bit technical, but I think I could make it clear. During the Second Vatican Council in Gaudium et Spes, there was deliberation on um, marital ethics. At one point, the council document stated that right behavior is not determined by subjective standards only, but by objective ones founded on the person and the person's acts, the nature of the person and the person's acts. Now, the official commentary on, on that uh, apparently non-threatening little statement was the following. By that phrase, the nature of the person and the person's act, we mean to uh, point out two things. First of all, it applies to all areas of human life, not simply the area under discussion in that document, which was marital ethics. It applies to business ethics. It applies to every area of a human relationship. Secondly, by the person, we mean the person integrally and adequately considered. Not just one dimension of the person. See, I encounter that so often. I just uh, uh, was discussing some of my travels of, of last week. I was over in Norfolk uh, uh, celebrating the 500th in vitro baby. At, uh, has been produced in that particular uh, institute, the Jones Institute for Reproductive Medicine. They had the first, I was there for that, and they had the 500th, you see. Um, in dealing with the physicians involved in this, uh, it became clear to me over a period of months that they were concerned with one thing, giving people a baby. and they would subordinate everything else to that. I had to remind them on several occasions that if you take seriously the person integrally and adequately considered, you can't simply pull out a single value and absolutize that to the neglect of others. Now, the reason that, that this is important is that it's a shift in the way things were done, not only in the Catholic community, but in the Christian community, uh, at large. In an earlier analysis, significance was drawn not from the person, but from a segmented or isolated dimension of the person. See, let me give you an example of this, dealing with speech. The way speech was analyzed for uh, many decades and even centuries was in terms of the faculty and its purpose. All right. Uh, what's the faculty? The faculty is speech. You see, what's its purpose? To communicate true information. All right. Faculty, finality, or purpose. Whenever I communicated false information, that was an abuse of the faculty. Faculty, finality, misuse in terms of that purpose. All right. That's rather harmless until you uh, transfer it into some other areas. Uh, for example, the sexual sphere. Wherefore are we sexual? Uh, from the time of Augustine on, uh, the Catholic and the Christian community has been deeply stamped with the idea that we are sexual primarily for procreation. That's the purpose of the faculty, the endowment. Therefore, faculty, purpose. Anytime that faculty is used is actuated in such a way that that purpose cannot be achieved or is thwarted. It's an abuse of the faculty, you see? And it seems to me that that has come right down uh, through the encyclical um, Humanae Vitae in 1968. Now, as I say, this becomes particularly delicate and controversial in this particular area because of the authority that has gone into prior statements. Once we say that it's the person who is the criterion of what is morally right and morally wrong, 
the nature of the question we bring changes. See, the question is not whether sterilization or contraception is a violation of the faculty. The question is rather this. Does such an intervention, is it likely to support or undermine human persons in this relationship? See, that's the proper question. And uh, that's not an easy uh, one to answer. One thing is clear. The answer cannot be deduced. It's, you've got to have empirical experience. You've got to observe to find out whether some of these interventions are indeed promotive of persons or violative, ultimately, of their dignity. Now, that will touch every one of those questions I mentioned at the very outset. It's the context in which we approach them, with the idea that the dignity of the human person is our criterion, our measure, for what is morally right and morally wrong. And number five that constitutes a change in context. I will call it the tentativeness of moral formulations. Now, this is an aspect of, of, of historical consciousness that is very upsetting to many people. Why? Because it seems to be a human hankering that our moral convictions be sempiternally true. We're, we're uncomfortable with the idea that something we hold today we may understand better tomorrow and modify our conclusions. Now, this is especially the case when the uh, authority of the institutional church stands behind a particular formulation. Yet two influences in contemporary times have forced us into a uh, new modesty in viewing our own uh, past achievements and formulations of our convictions. First of all, we have a new understanding of the complexity and changeability of the realities with which we deal. Secondly, we have a new understanding of the many cultural influences that have gone into our past formulations. Now, in combination, uh, they suggest powerfully that our grasp of the significance of our conduct, and therefore our judgments about what is right and wrong, is a much looser, more fragile, and tentative thing than we would perhaps feel comfortable in thinking. Now, this was explicitly recognized by the Second Vatican Council, this tentativeness. Uh, the Council stated, the deposit of faith or revealed truths are one thing. The manner in which they are formulated without violence to their meaning and significance is another. There you've got a clear distinction between two things, the substance of a conviction and its formulation at any particular time. Now, formulations are always the product of human beings with limited understanding, limited conceptual and verbal tools, and so on. And therefore, there always going to be a gap between the substance and how we manage to state it, you see. That holds true of our most basic beliefs, the resurrection, uh, the Eucharist, things like that. Our formulations of those things always can be improved which is not to say that they were wrong, simply to say they can be improved in light of the changing circumstances and people to whom we are speaking. Now, I want to take two sensitive areas of this. As I say, uh, moral theologians have to have a thick epidermis, and uh, therefore we do uh, try to apply things, and indeed in sensitive areas. I want to take two sensitive areas where adjustments seem to be in place of our formulations. One is abortion. Now, I think we know down our pulses as human beings that, uh, and with powerful warrants from uh, the sources of faith, that all persons are unique before our Heavenly Father and that no one of us can play God with regard to another. All right. Now, we also know that 
there are tragic conflict situations in which in order to to continue to adhere to the values we treasure in this case human life we must take human life See, those are those sticky situations that we find ourselves in at times now across our history we have attempted to provide for these exceptions and yet uh, uh, limit them in a way which will be ultimately for the good of human life. And we've done that with the formula, no direct killing of an innocent human being. No direct killing of an innocent human being. Now applying that to the situation of abortion, several popes have said that every direct abortion is morally wrong. Pius XI, Pius XII, even to save the life of the mother. In other words, in that rare uh, situation, extremely rare in modern medicine, but still possible, where you are faced with a choice of either losing both mother and fetus or intervening abortionally and saving the one you can save, the mother, even then that formula is understood by at least two popes forbade the intervention. And the way it was often put was better two deaths than one murder, you see. is admitting that the formulation was, it can't cover all cases. It's imperfect, you see. I remember the Belgian bishops in their statement to put up that case, that very case. And here's what they had to say. The moral principle which as follows. Since two lives are at stake, one will, while doing everything possible to save both, attempt to save one rather than allow two to perish. Uh, to me, that's common sense. But in an earlier formulation, that was forbidden. Some of you will recall the book, The Cardinal, where the priest stood by as his sister died trying to give birth to a child because they refuse to terminate. So the only point I'm making is that our formulations are inadequate and in constant need of restudy of critical approach, even those that are constantly proposed by teaching authorities in the church. That is not an attack on value. It's simply admitting that we're a pilgrim church and that even our moral formulations are en route, in via, that share the characteristics of imperfection of pilgrims. Now let's take another non-controversial example, uh, the area of human sexuality. Uh, for centuries, the church has been concerned to preserve uh, human sexual expression and intimacy as a viable language. Now, this effort has been stamped with periods of clumsiness, obviously. At any rate, uh, beneath the vari uh, variations of formulations, we can see that what the church was attempting to do, was struggling to do, was, was to say that uh, basically uh, sexual expression ought to be the language of covenanted relationships, of marriage. Or put in a little different language, uh, sex and eros are fleeting, fickle, and frustrating unless they're put into the context of philia, enduring friendship that we know as marriage. Now, in formulating this value judgment, with which I agree is an ideal, uh, she has said the following five things. Now, I ask you to keep in mind, what is the substance of her teaching? She said the following five things, and I can uh, document each one. First, Premarital sexual relations are morally wrong. That is, something is always missing in that conduct. Number two, it is wrong because it is against the good of the child. 
the prospective child. Three, it is intrinsically evil, that is to say, from its very object, in all circumstances, no matter what they be, that is intrinsically evil, it's morally wrong, it can never be justified. Fourthly, it's seriously wrong in every act. Fifthly, there's a presumption of serious guilt on the part of the individual in every act. Now, what, what is the substantial teaching of the church in contrast to certain formulations of it? I submit to you, it's the first statement. Something is always missing in this conduct. In that sense, it's, it's morally a faulty or wrong. The last four statements express variously philosophical, psychological uh, data as they are perceived at a particular point in history. Father, uh, uh, the famous Dominican Yves Congar, the historian of dogma, has summarized what I'm trying to say, and he put it this way about the popes. He said, the encyclicals of Leo XIII and Pius XII are theological. They are not purely the expression of apostolic witness according to the needs of the time, but a doctrine of the scholarly magisterium incorporating data from the natural law, human wisdom, and classical theology. And once you start bringing all these elements in to a, a gospel witness, you're bringing in limited human tools. That's going to show up in your formulations. Of course, the, there are elements in the community that regard this critical task that we all must participate in as being an attack on authority. I mean, I go through that every week with pickets and things like that. Um, and the next step, of course, is to accuse those who are uh, doing nothing more than their critical task of being disloyal. And uh, well, you, you've, you're familiar with the, the psychological uh, steps here. It's that which, in my judgment, is responsible for much of the polarization in the contemporary church. Uh, that failure to take our accountability to human reason and historicity seriously. Uh, the sixth uh, dimension of the context with which we approach these problems can be put in any number of ways. I will put it in this way, a change in the nature of uh, the moral magisterium. Now this applies more to Catholics than others, but there are magisteria in other churches even if they go unrecognized. Now. Um, our conception of the magisterium, of the teaching authority of the church, has undergone change in the past 25 years since the uh, conclusion of the council. That's to be expected because the very notion of church, of the ecclesia, the believing community, has undergone a change in description. And the magisterium is nothing but the church teaching. So if the notion of church undergoes a modification, so will this notion. Now, it's been pointed out by Avery Dulles, Father Kangar, and many others that the contemporary understanding of the teaching authority of the Catholic Church dates back to the year 1830. It reached its pinnacle in the year 1950 with the encyclical Humani Generis. Now, this model treats teaching in a very highly juridical way. The focus that went into its making produced a notion of teaching authority in the church with the following three characteristics. First of all, an undue distinction between the teaching and the learning function in the church with a, const with a, with a unique emphasis uh, on the authority to teach, little being said about the need to learn first. Secondly, a notion of uh, teaching with an undue identification of the teaching function with a single group within the church, the hierarchy, and thirdly, an undue isolation of a single aspect of teaching, that is, the final judgment, the decisive judgment. Thus, it was taken for granted by many people that no matter how complex a moral problem, when Rome has spoken, the matter is ended. Now, within the theological perspectives, altogether understandable for uh, the times in which they existed, um, within that context, 
uh, I, can, I can fully appreciate why that notion of magisterium existed. But now the factors that led to it have all been modified. And uh, we see quite a different notion of teaching authority uh, in our midst. And that's going to affect the very way we approach the problems that I mentioned at the outset. See, uh, The factors now, in contrast to the three I mentioned, would be a notion of teaching with the following characteristics. The learning process is integral to the teaching process. And therefore you have uh, Episcopal seminars, seminars in continuing education for bishops. That was unthought of 25 years ago. Bishops were thought to be in prior possession of the truth. Second, teaching is a multi-dimensional function, only a single aspect of which is judgmental, decisive, uh, the dotting of the I, the crossing of the T, you see. Thirdly, the teaching function involves the gifts of everyone in the community. Now, with, with these perspectives, much more attention is given to uh, evidence, analysis, the sciences uh, in the sectors of the community that can produce that type of thing. That means you, it means me. And therefore, we don't, when we approach some of the very concrete problems that I uh, mentioned at the outset, we don't approach them with the idea that after we have struggled ourselves to come to a conclusion, we can turn to a final arbiter. We don't do that anymore. We are the church. We have responsibilities within the notion of the church's moral convictions and statements. So rather than uh, a responsible obedience to an authority that hands down a decision in a rather unilateral way, we now talk about the response due to these teachings as a personal attempt to assimilate them, which can end in failure, can end in disagreement. And we feel quite at home with that idea as part of a pilgrim community. I, ref I uh, much prefer, therefore, to refer to the teaching learning function of the church in which we all have a responsibility. Uh, Bishop Butler has put all this, uh, one of my favorite bishops, he's uh, now dead, he, uh, unfortunately, but he uh, was very influential in the council. He's put all this beautifully when he, he talks about the response that, that we owe to uh, authoritative statements of the church. And here's, what he, here's the way he put it. I'm talking about, obviously, moral teaching of a non-infallible type. He says, the mood of the devout believer will be a welcoming gratitude that goes along with the keen alertness of a critical mind and with a good will concerned to play its part both in the purification and the development of the church's understanding of her inheritance. Now, when we realize that all of us within the community uh, are expected to bring the keen alertness of a critical mind concerned to play its role in the continuing purification of the church's inheritance, we've got a whole different attitude that we're bringing toward ecclesial discernment of moral problems. See, And our approach is different. Our context is different. Um, a, a bishop who will probably forever remain an auxiliary bishop, um, Juan Arzuba, uh, put this very beautifully in this way. There must be room for legitimate criticism and dissent from the ordinary teaching of the church, given the re very real possibility of the development of doctrine by way of correction and change of such teaching. To think otherwise is to sink our heads in the sand and hinder the work of the Spirit. Now, to hear a bishop uh, speak of correction and change uh, is to some people uh, offensive to pious ears, but to a renewed historical consciousness, it seems to me to be a breath of fresh air, possibly even that wind we know as the spirit. We would not have the church's teaching now on religious liberty if John Courtney Murray had not fought an uphill battle, very personally painful, uh, for many years against the previous teaching of 
uh, Pius the Ninth and Gregory the Sixteenth. My final contextual change is the following. A rejection of paternalism in moral pedagogy for a pedagogy of personal responsibility. This is perhaps the key change in terms of discernment and the approach, the context of moral problems. Now it's very easy to caricature here and I, uh, I don't want to do that, but it is not a caricature to say that as recently as 25 or 30 years ago, many of us with a moral problem, whatever it might be, personal, social, whatever, would take it to our counselor, our priest, lay out all the facts, and then you would get an answer, a yes or a no. I call that paternalism in moral education. The refusal on the part of the person seeking the truth to share in the search for it. See, to undertake responsibility for discovering along with others the truth. Now, we realize better than ever that the teaching of the community, of the church in that sense, only enlightens conscience. It doesn't replace it. And let me uh, just recall to you that uh, very beautiful statement of Gaudium et Spes, um, which is one of my favorites from the Vatican Council. Let the lay person not imagine that his pastors are always such experts that to every problem which arises, however complicated, they can readily give him a concrete solution, or even that such is their mission. Rather, enlightened by Christian wisdom and giving close attention to the teaching authority of the church, let the lay person take on his or her own distinctive role. Now, that's downright revolutionary. I think there are elements trying to take that back at the present time. It's a final goodbye to the dependency syndrome. But let me be clear about what it does not mean. It does not mean that we form our consciences in isolation. We're members of a community and we form our consciences in community. Anybody who thinks that we go off in a corner and decide what is right and wrong by ourselves is roughly analogous to the patient who makes her own diagnosis. That's a quick trip to the intensive care unit and very likely to the morgue. And it won't be any different in the moral spiritual life. What the council was trying to say was really two things. First of all, we all have competences and therefore we all have responsibilities. Uh, practically speaking, for example, a physician just by being a physician does not have an insight into the Christian dimensions of the healing profession. The church is urging that person to pray, reflect, study about those dimensions and then bring those to all of us. Otherwise the church will not have them and cannot reflect them in a topical, persuasive way to the world. Therefore, take the responsibilities that are inseparable from your own competence and experience. Take them seriously. Secondly, it was saying that the well-formed conscience cannot be pre-programmed. Uh, these remain an individual's responsibility, and that's because of the very complex individual and specific uh, character of the problems we have to deal with. Now, these are but seven uh, dimensions which I will call the contextual uh, atmosphere in which we approach any moral problem. To me, they're much more important than discussing the individual problem itself because they tell me a lot about how you or I or anyone is going to approach the problem what assumptions, what attitudes that person is going to bring. If we don't take the context seriously, then we don't take the contours of the problem seriously. Thank you very much. Do I just what do you want to do about this, Barry? Do, I, do we have questions or speeches or? <laughs> Father is willing to take questions and hear comments. Uh, there are two microphones in the center aisle. We would appreciate it if you could uh, uh, come there to ask your question or make your comment 
so that everybody can understand it. If you have a, a booming voice up there, you don't have to come, of course. Yes, please. What do you mean by situation ethics? Well, uh, let me make one or two points. Uh, first of all, I said nothing about uh, individuals having any gift of infallibility. In fact, my, my last statement toward the end was precisely that we don't form our consciences in isolation, right? We form them in community with the wisdom. That's part of it, too. Well, the magisterium would not say that. The council didn't say that. See? Uh, let me make another point that the word. Uh, situation, uh, I'll start uh, quite dramatically by saying that the finest situation ethician I know was St. Thomas Aquinas. Now that's meant to uh, alert you to the fact that the word uh, situation and situation ethic and situationist and so forth uh, need not be a dirty word. Uh, it has been used and can be applied to certain people and the sloppiness of their method. For example, I would use that of Joseph Fletcher in a pejorative way, because I think he's not analytically uh, precise and adequate. Uh, however, St. Thomas took morally relevant circumstances seriously, so seriously that he said they could change the nature of what I'm doing. And that is a very legitimate way of understanding the term situation ethics, you see. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to deal with the, the, the broad sweep of your, your statements because I certainly wouldn't uh, uh, agree that I said anything that you said. So, and I, I presume that I would uh, be supported by people in this group, that they wouldn't recognize in your statements uh, anything I said. This is what I've discerned. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we'd have a long con personal conversation about that, but. I feel objectively that the group here would not support you in saying that I led you to that or that that is implied in what I said. Well, if I can, if I can work that in, it's, uh, you know, I've got a lot of things I've been asked to do, so, you know. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I think I agree with that. Um, I'd be interested uh, in, in discovering what is, the, what is uh, a temptation of the professional moral theologian uh, in the contemporary world. Is there, is, is there any temptation that you could pinpoint as, 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 uh, as perhaps uh, potentially detracting from, from your own uh, Oh, sure. A lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them. Um, one is uh, the temptation of sloth. Uh, not, not really to do the research that's required to, to get an adequate grasp of the complexity of a problem. Um, another is a temptation of, um, of isolation. Most of the problems uh, now are 
um, are composite in nature. The practical problems in moral theology are dealing with various areas of life in, in which experience can, can have a very powerful say in our understanding of matters. For example, law, medicine, business, and so on, marriage. Um, one who is, uh, and this is simply a, a specification of slope, one who tries to do moral theology, and I know people of this type, uh, by locking themselves in their rooms and writing and not consulting uh, people, uh, that's a temptation. Another temptation is, of course, the temptation of pride, which is to, uh, to see what I've done in the past and to adhere to it, even in the face of very legitimate criticism, and not admit mistakes. Fourthly, there's, uh, you see well, how well I know these because uh, <laughs> I've reflected on them. Uh, another one is um, uh, the temptation toward a certain uh, public notoriety where a person would, uh, would seek uh, a type of you know, publicity for his or her opinions which is unwarranted by the profession of scholarship. If that happens, well, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes you can't resist it, but some people, I have the sense, seek it. Uh, another is a premature publication of, uh, in a disturbing way, of only tentative and rather fragilely argued uh, positions, which can disturb uh, people. And so there are quite a list of things that uh, I think one who is professionally involved in, in, in moral theology can succumb to. Well, I, I suppose very few of us succumb to that. That's uh, <laughs> take the easy way rather than the hard way. But uh, and I think that I, I would have to admit, in all cases, I've I've failed here and there at times. Uh, you know, when you get enthusiastic about something, you you you, you want to test it. You want to test it in public and. Well, it's easy does it, you know. Yes. Well, for the Constitution, uh, uh, that's one thing. I think that's been fairly well settled by the Council, but I think it, what, it, what the implications would be for the processes of the Church. The Constitution is that uh, we're all equally, through baptism, members of the Church. And, uh, you know, any, any further arrangements uh, are culturally conditioned, et cetera, et cetera. But um, that's the Constitution. But with regard to the processes, once, you, once you've, uh, as the Council has done, have, have urged people to take seriously their own competence and speak up, you see, courageously when they have a competence, you see, and not to uh, proceed as if uh, all the answers came from their pastors, you see, then you, you, the implications of that for the Church is the Church must listen to that. And to the extent that the church does not listen to those voices she recognizes as necessary sources of moral enlightenment, the very presumptions, you see, that ground the authority, the authenticity of her statements is correspondingly undermined. You see? Now let me give an example of what I mean by that, a concrete examples. There are two, uh, two documents that in my field recently, in the past 10 years, uh, one very excellent where a broad consultation did occur. And that was the document on the Declaration on Euthanasia in the mid-70s. And it got universal praise. And it's still a very useful document. Uh, it was very modest and stayed general, but it was very useful. Uh, the other was a document two and a half years ago on reproductive technologies, uh, which uh, provoked a firestorm. And uh, I feel virtually certain that the consultation was pre-programmed and uh, simply uh, wasn't adequate to the nature of the problem. 
and therefore you had four Catholic universities three or four days after the document appeared, European universities stated they were not persuaded and were going to continue to offer certain reproductive uh, technologies. So there you have a, a case where I think the proper processes were clearly present in one and rather obviously not in another, and the document suffered. So the, the implications for me is that, uh, that th there must be a thorough consultation in the church before a truly authentic statement that should be taken seriously by Catholics shall occur. See. Um, Father Herring has recently called for that, Bernard Herring. He says the church is so uh, fractionated now, so terribly divided, that the Pope simply has to uh, take this into account and get an objective consultation of bishops, lay people, and theologians on this one uh, birth control question. You see, So those are the implications there, that if we do have a say and a critical say, that's got to be listened to. But I don't, think we've, I don't think we've established properly the procedures for this. You see, For example, the 1980 synod that dealt with some of these uh, problems, family problems, was on everybody's acknowledgment rigged. It simply was not credible. It, it didn't really have to occur for the Pope to have written what he wrote afterwards, Familiaris Consortio. So those are some of the implications of procedure. It's a little messier, but I think more credible in the long run. And probably a good example of this would be the, the kind of messiness that is, is inherent in the, the processes adopted by the American bishops in their past two pastorals on peace and on the economy. They went through... Uh, two or three revisionary procedures, listened to all voices, took a lot of time, and uh, you don't have to agree with everything they said, but they came up with a wonderfully uh, credible document in both cases. And I, I think that their authority was enhanced as a result. What I, what I think is going on and I, uh, is that I think there's a latent fear on the part of some bishops that to the extent that they truly take consultation seriously, their authority is undermined. Whereas I think just the opposite is the case. The more that they will uh, take seriously your competence, your competence, and listen to it, and modify what they, have, what they say and do as a result, their authority is enhanced. But that's uh, an experience we yet have to go through. I wonder, Father, if we might make a few comments on uh, the extent to which the ecumenical It's absolutely essential. Uh, uh, by, profess by profession of several uh, statements, uh, authentic statements of the church in council, um, for example, the recognition of the ecclesial reality of other groups, the recognition of the fact that the spirit is present in those groups and we can be edified by their conduct, and the fact that we must seek uh, answers to complex moral and social questions in consultation with all men of goodwill. Those are explicit statements from the Council, so it's utterly essential. And uh, we're doing that now in, 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 in local, regional. Uh, I'm on the Catholic Me Methodist dialogue. We're dealing with medical problems, care of the dying, and things like that. And uh, But what beyond that is going on, I'm not sure. I, I have the impression that when moral statements are drawn up, uh, it, it's a Catholic club that's involved in it. That's the impression. I don't think there's broad ecumenical consultation. I think there should be. Let me take each one of those. Did you hear the question? Well, is he understanding me correctly to have said that there can be legitimate occasions of sinless premarital sex 
artificial birth control and abortion. Um, well, I, first of all, I didn't say that. Now, whether I would say it, we can discuss. What I, uh, no, what, what I did say was that I was talking about the substance and the formulation of the church's teaching, you see, on abortion and on premarital sex. And when I came to premarital sex, I gave you those five statements, the first one of which was, uh, the church has stated, that this is always morally wrong. Something's always missing from that kind of conduct. I, uh, I simply gave that as an example of, of one of the statements that the official church has made. Now, if you ask me, do I agree with that? You see, then you're getting a, uh, to your question, right? Yes, I would agree with that. I think something is always missing in that conduct. I think that uh, uh, the very reasons that people would would want to uh, adduce are the reasons judged to be insufficient. But uh, tomorrow I'm going to go into a, a very important distinction here between the moral and the pastoral. And uh, I think much more needs to be said, but I'll ask you to wait on that. Now, if you turn to the other subject, you've got to take each one of these individually. Uh, artificial uh, birth regulation. Uh, I find myself, with the vast majority of theologians, many bishops too indeed, in a position simply of saying that I think the church hasn't got this right yet. I think that uh, uh, artificial uh, forms of birth regulation can be morally justified. That's not encouraging people to do this as if we're just equal to other forms, saying it can be on occasion justified. With regard to abortion, you have to be very careful because you have to define what you mean by it. Um, should you call, for example, the prevention of implantation, um, say a morning after pill, after rape, should you call that an abortion or not? Well, there's a big literature on this. Uh, in other words, when should a woman be said to have conceived? Um, there was an article that appeared about, oh, I guess about 12 or 13 years ago in Theological Studies by uh, Dr. Diamond, a reproductive biologist, in which he argued that uh, we, we, uh, we should talk about three types of intervention into the reproductive processes. One would be anti-fertilizational that prevents fertilization, for example, a condom, okay? The other, the other extreme would be one which is clearly abortional, the emptying of the uterus of a conceived pregnancy. He well, said there's a third type which is neither that nor that, and that's an intervention which is anti-conceptional, that's what he called it. It, preverted, it prevents conception from occurring, a woman being said to conceive when she takes the uh, fertilized ovum, the zygote, into the uterus as implantation. Now, you can argue about whether that should be called an abortion or not. Uh, another, uh, you're talking marginal instances. For example, let's say you have a certain diagnosis of anencephaly. Are you familiar with this problem at all? Anencephaly? And, okay. So that's a child without a, uh, a brain. Uh, to terminate a pregnancy like that, would you say that's an abortion in the moral sense? In other words, does that, does that entity rise to the level of a protectable humanity? Well, I mean, one can discuss that. It's an arguable point, and it has been discussed. And there are people who believe that this is not what the church meant when she talked about an abortion. She simply didn't know of those cases then. So, you know, I think it's a tricky question. You have to get into definitions of abortions, but I'm very comfortable, by and large, very comfortable, except for marginal discussions like this, with the classic position on abortion at the moral level. So uh, to answer your question, did you hear me say that in certain cases, abortion, uh, premarital sex, and, and birth regulation were justifiable? I have to take each one by itself. Certainly with birth, birth regulation, yes. I didn't say it, but you... Uh, you're right to uh, conclude that I would. Premarital sex, no. Abortion, well, we just discussed it. Okay? Hey, Father McCormick, I was mm -hmm. wondering if you mentioned 
or would you allude today rather on this, I think you made the statement that the well-formed conscience cannot be programmed? Pre-programmed. Pre-programmed, yes. Would you elucidate on that? Uh, what I meant by that is that the uh, moral statements <clears throat> uh, which are informative of our consciences, informative of them, um, cannot uh, enter into such detail that they cover all conceivable circumstances. It's, it's simply beyond the limits of our conceptual and our verbal capacities. I think too often in the past we have presumed uh, that a general statement indeed can cover all contingencies. But this is not St. Thomas. St. Thomas said very clearly in a number of places, the more you descend into the concreteness and the details of uh, individual conduct, you see, the more you find exceptions occurring. And that moral norms, when they descend to those concrete levels, bind, as he said, only in general, or ut in pluribus was his language, only as a general rule. And uh, so that, that's what I meant. You can't, you can't simply pre-program the conscience so that what it says about a, a particular thing uh, will cover all circumstances. We have to assume the responsibilities ourselves for uh, entering into the messy details of, of some of our cases that we encounter. That's what I meant. Was that clear? Yes, that's clear. Okay. Yes? Father, uh, I noticed that most of the questions were on the personal level of, uh, the, of forming a personal conscience. I would like to ask you to say something perhaps more on what you mentioned about our lack of social conscience as to what is going mm -hmm. on in the world. Well, the only thing I wanted to say this evening was that there has been a shift in uh, uh, the way we view certain priorities in the moral life, and that therefore this constitutes the context in which we think about moral problems. Um, I meant by that simply that uh, uh, our recent popes have been urging us um, and especially, I would say, uh, Paul VI and uh, uh, J.P. II have been urging us to, to view these problems as the key moral problems, primary in importance. The problems of, of, of hunger, of poverty, of racism, of injustice, economic injustice, things like that. And, and you know, uh, I've had so many people, uh, in fact, it was, um, where was it? it was, I was out in Regina the Nash lecture about three weeks ago, and uh, a young man asked me a question at the end, and he said, well now, he said, here's my question. He was one of the picketers, so uh, he said, here's the question. Uh, he said, you have on the one hand, you have moral problems, you see, and on the other, you've got these social problems, you see, and he said, now these things are changing all the time, you see, they're, they're culturally conditioned. Whereas these moral problems, you know, of sexuality, they've been around for a long time. They're not uh, culturally conditioned. Well, first of all, you can see about five things went wrong in the way the very question was put. Here are moral problems, and then on the other hand, there are social problems, as if social problems were not moral problems. It's exactly what the popes are insisting, that they're the primary moral problems. You see? So that's all I was really concerned to say, that once you say that, then you approach the list of problems that I mentioned tonight, you might even eliminate some as matters irrelevant to my present concerns. You say then, all right, they're moral, but they, they, there are many more important things here than, uh, say, the problems of bioethics. That's all I meant to say, and uh, uh, I think we've been encouraged to shift our priorities by a succession of popes, but corporately, I don't think we have. I don't know of too many people, put it very concretely, I don't know of too many people, I include myself. Uh, I say this with tears, but uh, too many people who feel guilt about their, their apathy or their non-involvement in other people's suffering. This is one of those 3 a.m. questions. I mean, uh, 
Should we? And how, to what extent? But the fact is, I don't know too many who do. I know some who get really angry when they experience injustice. I have found that I only get angry when it's somebody close to me or in my family. Right? I don't like that. Uh, something's wrong. I haven't completely shifted my priorities in a way which has affected my own sensitivities and eventually my judgments and my concerns. I suspect I'm, I'm speaking for a number of people here too when I say that, that we all, uh, you know, honor that uh, conceptually but haven't managed to bring our full selves uh, into those priorities that we've been encouraged to do by the folks. That's all I really wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I would like to postpone an attempt at that because uh, in order to answer that question adequately, I would have to, uh, and I don't say this as a cop-out, I'd have to go about 35, 40 minutes. Um, I'm, I may take it up tomorrow when I deal with the difference between a moral statement and a pastoral procedure. That would be a good example. Um, I, I believe, uh, just very briefly, I won't try to answer that as adequately as it could be answered, but the heterosexual relationship of marriage is normative in our tradition. I mean our Christian tradition, not just Catholic, Christian tradition. Now by that I mean, by the word normative, all ought to strive to, for their own good to express their sexuality within that context, the context of uh, permanent uh, monogamous love, marriage. Now that, that's our tradition, you call it the bi biblical norm, it can be argued from any number of points of view, it can be argued from human wisdom and so on, but that's basically where we come from. Now the, the question then arises, what if someone by uh, psychic constitution is incapable of doing that? You see. Well, without changing your moral state. Uh, there may be ways of a pastoral accommodation for those people where they get as close to the norm as they possibly can see, if they are not called uh, to celibacy for the kingdom. Now each one of those statements you'd have to go into, who is called to celibacy for the kingdom, who is not, why not, how do you, what do you mean by that? See, um, th this is, your, I'm getting into my 35 minutes, uh, but uh, <laughs> You know, if somebody's a constitutional homosexual, this kid is tried, can't do anything else, uh, I don't know how many there are, uh, certainly some. But, and that person is not called to celibacy for the kingdom. I mean by that that the attempt to live uh, uh, an absolutely uh, continent life would, would lead that person, would, would be a cause of uh, suffering, both mental and physical, etc., to that person. You see, um, then you got you got to say, well, is there some accommodation that would be for the overall good of the person at the level of pastoral adaptation? Those things are thinkable. Even in in our traditional uh, moral theology. Um,